It is time for another excursion around the ionosphere to see what is happening in amateur radio and the wider world of communications. Now coming to the conclusion of our 23rd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1,235 of This Week in Amateur Radio. A major cyclone hits Bangladesh and amateurs are providing backup communications. The founder of the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service has become a silent key. Activity and awards increase at 222 MHz and 1296 megahertz. We will have all the details. A student radio contact with the International Space Station inspires a community recovering from Hurricane Ian. Last week's HARP experiment incorporated input from the amateur radio community. We will have all of that information for you. In FCC action this week, the commission is leveraging the 12 gigahertz band to help close what it calls the digital divide, and it proposes rules to prevent fake emergency alerts from getting issued by hackers. A new postage stamp commemorates World War II cryptographers. A new section manager is appointed in the Wyoming section. We will introduce you. And as many amateurs know, radio frequency interference can arise from multiple sources. We'll have the story of a rather unique source of RFI on board a ship in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, talks about how much power it takes to perform a single Google search, and he will update us on the state of the current chip shortage. Australia's own Anil Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will talk about the sedentary myth of amateur radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will introduce you to Frank Conrad, who, under the call sign ADXK, made radio history. And he will talk about the beginnings of radio broadcasting and the role amateur radio played in it. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, We'll talk about how to stay safe climbing commercial towers utilizing lockout tagout. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where our whole front area is covered in leaves, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting this week from the ham shack of K2MST in the Museum of Science and Technology in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, and where Halloween is just around the corner, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from our amateur radio station in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the nights are cold and frosty, yet the days are sunny and pleasant, and the song of the chainsaw is heard throughout our land, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. Reporting from the outskirts of the capital of New York State, this is Bob. W3BOO. Boo Radio. Boo Radio. Perfect for Halloween. And reporting from our Trey New York News Bureau, where we're all still raking, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we've settled into the calm before the storm this autumn, but it can't last, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. As we come to air this week, a deadly cyclone had enveloped parts of Bangladesh where the death toll continued to rise, according to reports from the Reuters News Service and other news sources. According to Al Jazeera, the cyclone barreled in from the Bay of Bengal 
with winds gusting up to 88 kilometers per hour and a storm surge of about three meters that flooded low-lying coastal areas. Mass evacuations preceded the arrival of Cyclone Citrang, and while there are not yet any published reports offering details of amateur radio assistance, we have learned informally that some stations in the country were attempting to help via VHF radio as power was lost. We will keep an eye on this developing story as we await details from the International Amateur Radio Union and other organizations and have a complete report next week. Some of you may be familiar with the Southgate Amateur Radio News website. If you listen regularly to This Week in Amateur Radio, you may know that Southgate is one of our major news sources for the program. We are sad to report the passing of our colleague, Richard Brunton, G4TUT. Richard died at age 77 as a result of a fall that happened on October 21st. The call sign may not seem familiar to you, but for decades Richard was editor of the Southgate Amateur Radio News website, which has a significant international following. Each and every day Richard would search the world's ham radio and technology resources, seeking out stories of interest and publishing them. Beyond the straight news items and specialist sections of his site, Richard encouraged non-commercial podcasts and blogs to promote ham radio opinion and stimulate debate on the essential subjects of the day. He also compiled the CQ Serenade weekly program, which was broadcast throughout Europe on shortwaveradio.de and other public-facing media. Richard himself was an intensely private man who had no close family, but he reached thousands of friends daily through his website. Amateur Radio has lost a statesman and a stalwart whose dedication to amateur radio was valued by amateurs around the world. As we come to air this week, the Southgate News site has vanished off the internet. We are in touch with other amateurs who were involved with the Southgate News and hope to be able to bring you an update on a site relaunch soon. Garth Crow, WY7GC, was appointed as the new ARRL Wyoming Section Manager on October 12, 2022. He replaced Rick Brenninger, N1TEK, who announced he was stepping down following the Rocky Mountain Division Convention held in early October. Brenninger served as the Wyoming Section Manager since April 2019. ARRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, officially appointed Crow after consultation with Rocky Mountain Division Director Jeff Ryan, K0RM. Crow previously served as Wyoming Section Manager from 2009 until 2015. He will now serve for the remaining portion of Brenninger's term, which runs through March 31, 2023. Nominating petitions for the next Wyoming Section Manager term of office, beginning April 1, 2023, are due at ARRL headquarters no later than December 9, 2022. Visit Section Manager Terms and Nomination Information on the ARRL website for more details. The Wyoming section is part of the ARRL Rocky Mountain Division, which includes Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah. Interest in ARRL's VHF and Above Worked All States Awards continues its flurry of activity now on the 1296 MHz band. To tell us more about the activity and awards on these bands, we go to John Ross, KD8IDG, at League Headquarters in Newington. As we reported in ARI World News in January, there have been several new generation additions to the Worked All States Award, now at 222, 1.25 meters, and at 1296 MHz, that's 23 centimeters. The original rush to 1.25 meters Worked All States began in the early 80s when the first 10 WAS awards were issued. Well, recently, the 1.25-meter uh, worked all state ranks have grown to 16 with recent achievers, including number 13, John Swinarski, K1OR of Pelham, New Hampshire, number 14, David Curl, N9HF of Ormond Beach, Florida, number 15, Ray Rector, Jr., WA4, NJP in Grillsville, Georgia, and number 16, Charles Benz, N0ACK in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. 
An energized pool of rovers activating rare states at both 222 and 1296 have recently contributed to the chase with the addition of four new 1296 megahertz worked all states award recipients. At early September, 1296 megahertz worked all states award number four was awarded to Frank Potts, NC1L of Southwick, Massachusetts. Recent award efforts accentuated a 14-year history of increased activity on the band starting in the summer of 2007 when 1296 megahertz worked all state award number one was achieved by our award W5LUA. Many 20 centimeter, 23 centimeter operators have benefited from the flurry of portable and rare state activations during the past two decades. These rover operations substantially benefited DX stations, said ARR Radio Sport Manager Bart Chanke, W9JJ. It's important to realize that these DX location 1296 megahertz worked all state award winners had uh, to contact all 50 states via moon bounce. The new class of 222 and 1296 megahertz worked all state award recipients sought these awards often during efforts of several decades and such they deserve recognition. Congratulations to all of the newest 222 and 1296 megahertz worked all state award recipients on their extraordinary accomplishments, said Janke. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Frank Potts, NC1I of Southwick, Massachusetts, visited ARRL headquarters in September, receiving his number four 1296 megahertz Worked All States Award certificate. In late September, Worked All States Award number five was awarded to Vlada Masik, OK1KIR of the Czech Republic, also in late September. Worked All States Award number six was issued to HB9Q, the DX Group HB9 CRQ in Switzerland. In late October, Zdenek Samik LK1 DFC, also in the Czech Republic, was awarded the Worked All States Award number seven. In August 2021, Al Katz K2UYH earned Worked All States Award at number three. Katz is known worldwide for supporting EME, Earth, Moon, Earth, the community with the 432 and above EME newsletter from 1995 to present as well as earning the first 432 megahertz Worked All Continents Award in 1976. For more information on the Worked All States Awards, visit www.arrl.org slash WAS. The International Telecommunication Union has announced that the 2023 World Radio Communication Conference will be held on November 20th through December 15th, 2023 in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. World Radio Conferences are held every three to four years, at which time delegates from around the world review and, as needed, revise the International Telecommunications Union Radio Regulations, which provide an international framework for regulation of the RF spectrum and the orbits of communication satellites. The radio regulations include the basic structure of the amateur radio service, including frequency allocations and license requirements, the ARRL and International Amateur Radio Union are always involved in pre-conference deliberations and send observers to the conferences. Students from the Canterbury School in Fort Myers, Florida were able to spend a few minutes on Monday, October 24, 2022, talking with astronaut Josh Casada, KI5CRH, on board the International Space Station using ham radio. John Ross, KD8IDJ, has more. The radio contact, arranged by the Amateur Radio on the International Space Station program, ARIS, provided hope for a community devastated by Hurricane Ian. School officials estimated that 30% of the school's faculty, staff, and families were left homeless after the hurricane passed through their area. The contact was made just after 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and students were able to ask astronaut Kasana questions ranging from, is the sun brighter in outer space, to, what's your favorite meal? The contact lasted just over 10 minutes when ISS was over the Caribbean Sea. Members of the Fort Myers Amateur Radio Club, an ARRL special service club, supported the school by providing students with technical instruction and radio equipment. The club's call sign W4LX was used to operate the ground station that established and maintained the contact with the ISS. The school used the Kenwood TS-2000 transceiver for the event, and several students at the school built a satellite tracking antenna system capable of locking onto and tracking a satellite while in range to receive the ISS signal. An Eric's News release released uh, that students were preparing for the big day. They saw the first pictures of Hurricane Ian, as seen from ISS, bearing down on the coast of Florida. Evacuations were ordered in advance of that catastrophic storm and winds and storm surges, which eventually affected many of the homes and students, faculty, and staff. 
In the wake of this destruction, it was uncertain whether the era's contact could occur. However, if only for a moment of reprieve from their loss and destruction, the entire Canterbury School community, including the school's staff, faculty, and amateur radio operators, students, and students' families, decided to pull together to support the era's contact and thereby renew their sense of hope and inspiration in human space exploration. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Here is a sample of what the contact sounded like on the air. November Alpha 1, Sierra Sierra. Whiskey 4, Lima X-ray for scheduled Aris contact, over. Hello, Canterbury School. This is John, and welcome aboard the International Space Station. Over. John Casada, this is Brian Darley with Fort Myers Amateur Radio Club. With Canterbury, are you ready for our students? Over. NA-1SF is ready. Over. Is for Nina. She is three years old. Nina would like to know. Can you come in to say? Over. Nina, what a question. Space is awesome, and somehow it would be even more awesome with cupcakes. We don't have an oven, but we did have cake in a tube. It came out like toothpaste, and it was pretty good. Over. This is Layton, she is four years old, and she would like to know. How do you not get lost in space? Hey, Layton, it's super easy to get lost in space when you get flipped upside down. And I think that the easiest way to get lost is to not know where you are. So the first thing I do when I feel like I'm getting lost is I don't believe my eyes. I just see what I see and then make a map in my mind. And that way, I can figure out where I really am, and then I'm not lost. My name is Isaac, and, and I'm in first grade. I'm six. Does the sun look different from the ISS? Over. Hey, Isaac, we are above the atmosphere up here, so I have noticed that the sun even seems brighter up here. Every so often, I'll float by a window, and I'll catch a glimpse of the sun, even sometimes on accident, and it is really, really bright. Over. The Fort Myers Amateur Radio Club website has a link to the video of their entire contact with the ISS. Following an intense 10-day period of experiments that were to be concluded by Friday, October 28th, scientists at the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program plan to be studying their results along with observations from participating amateur radio operators. HAMS had been invited to monitor daily transmissions that included HF ocean scatter, interactions between satellites and the ionosphere, moon bounce, and an unprecedented attempt to bounce a signal off of Jupiter. The scientists were also exploring possible reasons behind the air glow phenomenon known as Strong Thermal Emissions Velocity Enhancement, or by the acronym STEVE, and testing whether radio transmissions could be used to measure the interiors of near-Earth asteroids. The program manager, Jessica Matthews, called the research the most diverse to ever take place at the Alaska facility and contained the highest number of experiments to date. She said researchers were relying on citizen scientists around the world. The research was funded by a $9.3 million grant from the National Science Foundation. Participating hams were able to file their reports electronically to the lab, making them eligible for QSL cards. The ARRL Foundation is now accepting applications for grants to amateur radio organizations for its 2023 scholarship program. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with more details on the program in this report filed from League Headquarters. The grants program awards limited funding to organizations for eligible amateur radio-related projects and initiatives, particularly those where they focus on educating, licensing, and supporting amateur radio activities. Youth-based projects and initiatives are especially encouraged. The ARRL Foundation Grants Program accepts uh, proposals in a cyclical model three times a year in February, June, and October. Proposals for the October grant period are being accepted now through October 31st. Awardees will be notified approximately one month after the closing of each cycle. 
and the ARRL Foundation Scholarship Program will award more than 100 scholarships to deserving radio amateurs pursuing higher education. Individual scholarships range from $500 to $25,000, and all applicants must be an active FCC-licensed amateur radio operator and submit a completed online application by noon on January 4th, 2023. Active foreign amateur radio operators are eligible for the Amateur Radio Digital Communication Scholarships. The ARRL Foundation Scholarship Committee will review all applicants for eligibility and award decisions. Scholarship recipients will be notified in May of 2023 via USPS and email, and awards are mailed directly to recipient schools. Additional information and a link to the application process can be found at www.arrl-scholarship-program. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. For the 2023 scholarships, the ARRL Foundation will be utilizing the same scholarship management platform that was used for the 2022 scholarships. Transcripts and additional requirements must be submitted with the application and are not emailed separately. A number of scholarships required additional documents, such as a letter of recommendation from a sitting officer of an ARRL-affiliated club, Applications without accompanying transcripts and additional required documents, if applicable, will not be considered. The ARL Foundation administers programs to support the amateur radio community and was established in 1973 by ARRL. Once again, the link for the Foundation Scholarship is www.arrl.org right slash scholarship dash program. Sending messages the old-fashioned way by postal service just got even more traditional for letter writers and bill payers in the United States. A new postage stamp has been issued honoring women of the United States military who handled messages in a much less straightforward way. They were the cryptologists of World War II, the backbone of an operation that contributed in a big way to the Allied victory. The stamp was formally released on Tuesday, October 18th at a ceremony in Maryland. The stamp is a tribute to the more than 11,000 women who worked tirelessly with the traffic of intercepted enemy messages that were sent encoded. Like so many others in the military at that time, they were sworn to secrecy about their roles. The stamp's design features a recruitment poster seeking the participation of these women who were known as WAVES an acronym for Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. In announcing the new stamps, the U.S. Postal Service called the women STEM pioneers, adding that they opened the door for women in the military and have helped shape information security efforts for future generations. The huge dish at the Arecibo Observatory was destroyed by the telescope's collapse in 2020. The National Science Foundation has decided not to rebuild the iconic radio telescope at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, instead winding down current scientific projects there and converting the facility to an educational center to serve as a hub for STEM education and outreach. In an announcement in mid-October, the National Science Foundation said it was soliciting proposals to manage the education, research, and outreach elements of the new center. The announcement also specified that the solicitation does not include rebuilding the 305-meter telescope or operational support for current scientific infrastructure, such as the 12-meter radio telescope or LIDAR facility. According to Angel Vazquez, WP3R, the head of the telescope's operation at Arecibo, all current scientific work at the facility will end on September 30th, 2023. Yahoo! UK News reports that Russian troops currently invading Ukraine usually use ERA cryptophones, which require a functioning 3G or 4G network to be in place. But by destroying many of the mobile phone masts around them, they've rather shot themselves in the foot and have been forced to switch to insecure communications. The report cites the investigative work of Bellingcat, an open-source investigative journalism organization which specializes in uncovering information on events such as the Salisbury poisonings and the situation in Syria by analyzing large datasets. 
According to Bellingcat's executive director, Christo Groziev, the Russian military tried unsuccessfully to use their era cryptophones in Kharkiv after destroying many mobile phone cell towers and also replacing others with their own stingrays. Stingrays are eavesdropping devices that are used to replace and pretend to be normal cell towers so that nearby mobiles connect to this Russian listening device instead and can thus be intercepted without the user realizing. Realizing. But without 3G or 4G for their own secure era encrypted phones, the Russian army in Ukraine has been obliged to put local analog SIM cards into their mobiles to communicate, which are very easy to intercept. And that's just what has been happening, allowing Ukraine intelligence to eavesdrop on Russian army conversations. You can read the full Yahoo story at uk.news.yahoo.com. The Federal Communications Commission on Thursday proposed rules that would require companies that participate in public alert systems to report cyber breach incidents that affect certain equipment within 72 hours. The FCC's notice of proposed rulemaking in FCC 22-82 was approved on a bipartisan basis by all of the agency's commissioners and is intended to improve the operational readiness and security of the country's public alert system. Emergency alert system and wireless emergency alerts. These systems warn Americans about emergencies to alerts on their TVs and radios and mobile phones. The rulemaking is intended to protect against cyber attacks by requiring emergency alert participants to report incidents of unauthorized access within 72 hours, and the FCC said in the proposed action notice. This would allow the Commission to work with participants and other government agencies to resolve an equipment compromise before it's exploited to send phony alerts. If enacted, the rules would also enhance security measures by requiring emergency alert system participants and wireless providers that deliver the emergency wireless alerts to annually certify that they have a cybersecurity risk management plan and implement sufficient security protocol for their alerting systems. It would also create a buffer against fake or false alerts by requiring participating wireless providers to transmit sufficient authentication information to ensure that only valid alerts were displayed on consumer devices like phones and televisions. The proposals came after the Federal Emergency Management Agency warned in August that hackers can use the U.S. emergency system to issue TV, radio, and cable network alerts if encoder and decoder device software isn't properly updated. FEMA issued an advisory to broadcasters after learning the exploit could be used to a large audience at the DEFCON hacking conference in Las Vegas that ran in early August. The FCC has adopted a new rule requiring owners of out-of-service satellites to remove them from orbit within five years, a significant acceleration from the previous rule, which was provided a 25-year deorbiting window. According to the AMSAT News Service, the goal is to reduce the risk of collisions in the ever more crowded low Earth orbits inhabited by many communication satellites. The reduction in time was recommended by NASA, which is concerned about the growing amount of space junk in Earth orbit. Again, according to AMSAT News Service, it's estimated that there are already some 100 million pieces of space junk in orbit, much of it too small to track, but not too small to cause significant damage in a collision. The ANS report did not indicate what impact the new rule may have on amateur satellites, some of which have spontaneously reactivated themselves after many years of theoretically being out of service. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. I felt, I don't know, what are you, how, how are you feeling these days? I feel... Now, I'm in an unusual situation because I overshare already. I'm on the air talking to people five days a week, four days a week. So by the time I get home, I feel like anything that anybody wants to know about me is already out there. So I don't use Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and social networks like that, probably in the way a normal person would to let people know what I'm up to and to promote stuff. It just... Uh, I don't, I don't feel the need. It's the same reason I got my ham license, you know, my amateur radio license. I was very excited. I really enjoyed it. Took the test, got the, the general license and got all the equipment and stuff. And then I never use it because I realized, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm already talking to people <laughs> for my work all day, every day. And the last thing I want to do 
I know there are people. I know Art Bell. Art Bell, he'll do his. He used to do his radio show, get off the air, and then go on uh, and 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 talk to hams for two more hours. I just want to go home and watch TV. <laughs> I just want to shut up. You know how much energy a simple Google search uses. We don't think of it. We don't really think of that, do we? I mean, we don't. We don't go. Oh wow! I got to cut back on my Google, <laughs> my googling. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta slow down on my googling because it's using up a single, according to, well, the UK's independent fact-checking charity, fullfact.org. A Google search, and this is Google's own estimate. A Google search, each and every one, and how many trillions of searches a day, right? Each and every one could power a ten-watt light bulb for 108 seconds. <laughs> Just 108 seconds. So if you see you see an overestimate somewhere, that's his Google's own. That's a 60, uh, equivalent of a 60-watt LED bulb. It's a 10-watt. So an LED bulb for 108 seconds. Okay, you might say, okay, that's pretty trivial. It's not, though. Add that up. How many searches a second go through Google? That's that's the issue. The point I The only point I'm making here is that... We don't think about the cloud using energy, but it does. It uses a ton of energy, and we're using it all the time. Every time you go on the net, every website you visit, every search you make, when you go you know, to Google and you type in a search term, it's as if these machines are going, think about what it's got to go through. Billions and billions of bytes of data looking for that one little thing. You know, who won the Super Bowl in 2019? You go, and it's it spins up energy and these companies google microsoft amazon apple because of this when they build their big network operation centers which are just giant buildings giant tilt up buildings with thousands of computers inside they're just little they're called rack mount because they can they can they don't stand on a desk they sit in a rack and they're lined up they're rack mount computers thousands of them row upon row of blinky lights all connected by wires and it's not just the computers those things use energy you know they heat up oh they heat up that's another problem you got to have a lot of air conditioning in there to keep the i mean imagine if you put 10,000 computers in a in a small you know, in a 10,000 square foot space, how hot it would get in there. So you've got to have giant air conditioning. So a lot of power used up by these network operation centers. And then, and not to mention all the switches and all the networking stuff. And then, you know, you got to pay for that power. So companies tend to build their network operation centers in places where power is cheap and cooling is available, which often means near hydroelectric facilities uh, up in Oregon where it's cooler uh, and, and they have a cheap power northern virginia for some reason that's a big nova is a big area where a lot of north carolina too it's a, it so they they're actually out there trying to find places where we can run these network operation centers cheap and and if you think about it when you do a google search it's not just one network operations center they're all over the place they're all over the world in fact some of these companies have so much computing power on the line that they'll just rent out the excess from time to time that's how that's actually how the first online services start you may remember if you're an old timer it's funny i always know when somebody's been computing for a long time if they're an old timer if i say what's your compu serve id and they go oh seven five one oh six comma three one three five that's that was mine if you remember your compu well compu serve came about because h and r block the big tax firm had lots of computers to do taxes, but they noticed they weren't real busy. <laughs> April 16th, it got a little quiet, and they said, we should do something. We've got all these computers. We don't really can't really shut them down. They're, they're churning along. We should do something. So they started an online service called CompuServe. General Electric did the same thing. They called it Genie. There's no excuse for America Online. That's just, <laughs> that just, that just happened. So this is, the, and that's what Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple uh, all do. They they lease out computing power. Google has the Google Compute Engine and the Elastic Cloud, or is that Amazon? I think Amazon's the Elastic Cloud. Uh, they have AWS, Amazon Web Services. Turns out they make more money on AWS than they do on selling stuff to you. Did you know that? Amazon, in order to be Amazon, had to put all these computers together, build these network operations centers. They also had to build uh, fulfillment centers, right? Big warehouses all over the country where your stuff is so that they can ship it out to you. 
And uh, Jeff Bezos, you don't get to be the richest man in the world without a little bit of smarts, right? He said, hmm, we got all this excess capacity, both in fulfillment centers and in computing. What can we do with it? They created Amazon Web Services, many billions of dollars a year in revenue. It's very profitable for them. For storage, for computing. If you go to a website, most of your websites, most of the places you go are not, you know, if you go to uh, the Washington Post, it's not some computer in Washington, D.C. No, it's an Amazon server, Amazon Web Services server somewhere else. AWS is even my website. If you go to techguylabs.com or a podcast site, twit.tv, those are running on Amazon Web Services. Everybody does. Why would you want to do anything else? Amazon, it's cheap. It's got all this extra stuff. And then they had all these fulfillment centers. What else did they do? Well, about half of all the stuff you buy from Amazon now isn't from Amazon. You're buying it from a third party that is using Amazon's facilities to store and ship their stuff. It's actually been an amazing success, not just for Amazon, but just for our economy, because it's a lot easier to start a business. Whether you're going to be a, a software startup, a website, maybe you're going to sell stuff out of your house. You don't have to have a fulfillment center. You don't have to have shipping. You just say, okay, Amazon, you handle it. I'll send you the order. You handle it. And you, you make your little profit. Some of it goes to Amazon. Same thing with computing. If you're a startup, I don't want to have to run a server. I don't, you know, so you can do it on Amazon or, or you know, Microsoft does this, Google does this. A lot of companies do it now with their excess server capacity. It's kind of interesting. It's really kind of powered this modern uh, technology age. We don't think about it. It's it's infrastructure. It's it's the cloud. It's out there. But to, no, it's the cloud. When you do a Google search, many dozens of computers wake up and say, hello. They pull down enough power to power a 10 watt bulb for 108 seconds and they give you the answer. And boy, do they give you the answer fast. Think about that. We just take this by, for granted now. But if I type in who won the Super Bowl in 2019, I don't even have to type it. I could just, I can ask Siri, who won the Super Bowl in 2019? Patriots beat the Rams in the Super Bowl by a score of 13 to 3 on February 3rd, 2019. That was less than one second to get that answer in 108 minutes, no, seconds of light bulb power. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? We really take that for granted. There is a whole bunch of stuff and it's happening invisibly behind the scenes. Pretty cool, I think. We live in interesting times, don't we? Uh, let's see, what else is uh, in the news? Boy, you know, I've been doing, uh, I've been doing this show since the early 90s. And uh, at that time, when I started doing it, you couldn't say technology was all around us. I mean, people had computers on their desks, but the internet usage wasn't widespread. In fact, hardly anybody used it. Email, uh, when I first started this, didn't even go uh, from one person to another. You you had to all be on the same platform. You remember MCI mail? You could only email. It was electronic mail. You could only email other people with MCI mail or Genie or CompuServe or AOL. You could only email AOL people, right? And then... A few years later, all of a sudden, the internet, and you could email anybody anywhere. That's when the changes started. The big change, I guess, 2007, about 15 years after I started. Is that right? Yeah. 15 years after I started uh, doing this show. That can't be right. Yeah, it is, though. Uh, <laughs> then uh, that's when the iPhone came out and everything changed because all of a sudden you had the internet in your pocket. You were always, always on, always connected. Man, man, now we're now we're in the world of TikTok and Snapchat and Twitter and Facebook and the Goog. It's really changed, but that's part of the fun for me, at least. It's not boring; it never stops. And of course, it means you need me even more. I'm here if you need me. I'm your tech guy. This week, the president met with uh, executives from many of the big tech companies, as well as the CEOs of Ford and General Motors to address the ongoing chip shortage. Both Ford and GM have had to slow down lines producing cars and trucks because they couldn't get the special automotive chips now that everything's got a chip in it. <sighs> uh, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger, who was, was there, said, it's going to be a couple of years before we get our new plants up uh, online in Arizona. They're going to spend $50 billion. I'm sorry, $20 billion to do that. The president is is chipping in, get it, uh, uh, $50 billion for a chip production infrastructure plan. It's a crisis, but the problem is the solution to the crisis 
isn't short term. You can't just automatically wave a wand and make more chips appear. You got to build factories. And many of those factories, good news, will be built in, in the U.S., which I think is prudent, especially if we're putting the money in, right? So 2023, maybe, before this stuff eases up. Yikes. TSMC, which is a big Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company, that's what TSMC stands for, is uh, ponying up $100 billion over the next few years to build plants, including... A $12 billion chip fab, they, that's what they call these fabrication and assembly plants, a chip fab in Arizona. Yay. You know, there's a couple of things going on here. Concern about tariffs, but more importantly, concern about the geopolitical situation with China, even with regards to Taiwan. It's uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't want to be completely reliant on manufacturing in China, which most tech companies, in fact, most companies, period, are in the U.S. and around the world. So this is... A long-term plan that ain't going to give us any short-term relief. It's not just uh, COVID, by the way. It's natural disasters. There have been a number of fires, three as, as far as I remember, in chip factories, which have really reduced production. It's also, we want more chips. <laughs> We're eating them up like crazy. Was it Lay's potato chips who said, you know, eat as many as you want, we'll make more? It ain't that way with microprocessing chips. They're hard to make. They're expensive to make. And the planning happens years before. So they planned a certain amount. With COVID, everybody, you know, computer sales were up. Tablet sales were up. Even cellular, you know, smartphones were up. Cars started using chips. A lot of devices that didn't use chips before started using chips. Suddenly the demand is exponential and everybody was caught a little off guard. So it's going to be a couple of years before that eases up. A couple of years. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. On November 2nd, 1920, Warren G. Harding was elected President of the United States. Millions read the election results in the newspapers the next day. In the Pittsburgh area, however, hundreds heard the election returns the moment they were wired in, thanks to Dr. Frank Conrad, a Westinghouse employee who broadcast the results over 8XK, his amateur station. This station would evolve into KDKA, and the night of November 2nd, 1920, has been called the start of the multi-billion dollar broadcast industry. But was it? Let's take a look at the evolution of broadcasting and the amateur's role in it. The idea of broadcasting was first considered by Lee DeForest in May 1902, when he wrote that ultimately, wireless telephony will be possible. He urged the financial backers of the DeForest Wireless Telegraph Company to develop and patent the concept. The stockholders, however, were more interested in immediate profits through massive stock sales rather than genuine development and refused to finance the necessary research. Undaunted, DeForest in 1907 formed the DeForest Radio Telephone Company. In a statement that for 1907, must have appeared to be radical or even bizarre, but was amazingly prophetic, he wrote, I look forward to the day when opera may be brought into every home. Someday the news and even advertising will be sent out over the wireless telephone. Despite DeForest's intense interest in this area, he was not the first to broadcast the human voice and music over the airwaves. That honor belongs to Reginald Fessenden, a Canadian professor. He was the first to recognize the inherent flaw in the concept of spark transmissions and set out to find an alternative. His quest led him to Schenectady, New York, and the services of General Electric's most brilliant scientist, Charles Steinmetz. Fessenden explained his idea, an alternator capable of generating waves of 100,000 cycles per second or 3,000 meters. Steinmetz and his assistant, Ernst Alexanderson, worked for almost two years and finally produced an alternator that met Fessenden's requirements. The Alexanderson alternator, as it was now known, was delivered to Fessenden's station in the fall of 1906. 
On the evening of December 24, 1906, ship and amateur operators heard something in their headphones they had never heard before. Someone speaking. A woman singing. Someone reading a poem. Fessenden himself played the violin. Not to be outdone, DeForest continued his radio telephone experiments in the period of 1907 through 1910, broadcasting from the Eiffel Tower and live from the stage of the Metropolitan Opera, where Enrico Caruso was singing. However, all of these transmissions had one major problem. Without a pure, stable, direct, current CW carrier to modulate, all of the signals had a background whine and distortion. Real development in the area of modulated carriers would have to wait until Armstrong discovered the oscillating properties of a regenerative circuit. By 1916, both Armstrong's circuit and the Audion were widely circulating in the radio world and broadcasting surfaced again. Lee DeForest resumed his transmissions with programs of good music, culture, and lectures. DeForest can be credited with two firsts in 1916. The first advertisements for his Audion and other products and the broadcast of the presidential election between Woodrow Wilson and Charles Evans Hughes. Unfortunately, DeForest signed off before the California results were in, so he declared Hughes the winner over Wilson. Also in 1916, amateur station 2ZK broadcast one hour of music each night. David Sarnoff, who had manned his station during the Titanic disaster, also got into the act. He wrote a memo to his employers at American Marconi, suggesting a radio music box, which would become a household utility. He went on to describe his vision of radio broadcasting and then turned to finances. He predicted an income of $75 million a year from the sales of receivers. Marconi, still focusing on ship-to-shore telegraphy, took no action on the memo. After amateurs had returned to the air in November of 1919, hundreds of them began to explore the area of broadcasting. In May 1920, amateur station 8XK joined many other hams in the transmission of music. Incidentally, it was legal for amateurs to broadcast music, news, sports, lectures, advertisements, or indeed just about anything else they wanted. The Radio Act of 1912, still in effect, did not mention amateurs. Rather, one paragraph made a general reference to individual private or commercial stations. The only real restriction was the 1 kilowatt power limit and the 200 meter wavelength. After that, the government didn't care. Thus, those amateurs who had built equipment to modulate their CW transmitters eventually played a phonograph record or two, sang, or tried to sing, or broadcast some form of entertainment. With all of the above documented evidence, why is November 2nd, 1920 considered the start of broadcasting? The answer lies not at the transmitter, but at the receiver. Prior to that night, all broadcasts had, in effect, been from one amateur to another or to a commercial station. The November broadcast, though, was designed and promoted by Westinghouse as a transmission to the general public. Starting in September, stores were selling basic receivers for $10 to receive 8XK. Westinghouse, in effect, had seized DeForest and Sarnoff's idea and was marketing it to the general public. Thus, it was the makeup of the listening audience that defined the start of broadcasting. When the word of this successful transmission got out, more amateurs got into the act and set up their own little broadcast stations. By the end of 1921, it was estimated that about 1,200 amateurs had made at least one broadcast. Some had a regular schedule of programs and would evolve into commercial stations. Others did it just out of curiosity. But there were listeners. Over 400,000 people heard the Dempsey-Carpenter fight on July 2nd, 1921. Radio sales were approaching 100,000 per year, not counting crystal sets, which were selling at the rate of 20,000 per month. However, with this explosive growth came two problems for the amateur. The first was an identity crisis. What should the role of the amateur be in broadcasting? Some thought that we should stay out of it and just stick to traffic handling on CW. Others envisioned the amateur as a jack-of-all-trades, expert CW operator and relay station, as well as community broadcaster. In fact, a new name evolved to describe this amateur broadcast hybrid, citizen radio or wireless. Even QST was confused. For a period of time in 1921, the word citizen replaced amateur on the front cover. 
The other problem was frequencies. Everyone, amateur, broadcaster, and hybrid, was on 200 meters. Tuning across the dial in 1921, one would hear mostly CW, a few spark holdouts, and the new broadcasters. While the amateurs were used to the interference, the general listening public was not. They had purchased their radios to hear music, not CW. Complaints started to pour into the Secretary of Commerce. Legally, he was powerless as the Radio Act of 1912 offered no solutions. A conference was called for all interested parties held in Washington in February 1922 to try to resolve the impending crisis. Even though he was exceeding his authority under the Radio Act, Secretary Hoover was able to get the following proposals accepted at the conference. 1. Henceforth, special broadcast licenses would be issued. Two frequencies would be available for broadcasters immediately. 360 meters, or 833 kilocycles, for regular transmissions, and 485 meters, or 619 kilocycles, for crop reports and weather forecasts. 2. After the marine interest had abandoned the 220 to 545 meter range, or 1363 to 550 kilocycles, it would be turned over to broadcasting. 3. Broadcasting was forbidden by amateurs who were defined for the first time by his name as stations operating without pay or commercial gain merely for personal interest. 4. Quiet hours were imposed on all amateur stations effective from 8 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. daily and on Sunday morning. The fact that the number of broadcasting stations dropped from 1,200 to 30 immediately after these regulations went into effect shows just how many amateurs were in fact pioneer broadcasters. This agreement, however, was a house of cards. Secretary Hoover had stretched his authority under the Radio Act of 1912 well past the breaking point. In 1926, the cards came tumbling down and the summer of anarchy was ushered in. How would amateurs fare with no enforceable regulations in place? Join us the next time as the Ancient Amateur Archives explores the events leading up to the creation of the Federal Radio Commission. This is Bill Cottonelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. The Federal Communications Commission announced this week that it is opening a new window for applications under its Honors Engineer Program. The one-year developmental program may lead to a term or permanent appointment. The Commission is accepting applications from recent graduates with an engineering degree and current students graduating in December of 2022. Among the duties included in the job description is training to perform propagation analysis of terrestrial, satellite, and or airborne systems or evaluating the emissions characteristics of various transmitters to validate the coexistence with neighboring systems. Projects may also involve various computer software engineering and scientific applications. An FCC news release describes that honors engineers will work alongside senior staffs on projects including developing technical rules and policy approaches to enable the U.S. to introduce new communications technologies and services such as 5G, 6G, advanced Wi-Fi, the Internet of Things, next-generation TV broadcasting, and new broadband satellite systems, facilitating wireless and wireline broadband service deployment throughout the nation, including to rural and underserved areas identifying technologies to improve access to communication services for all Americans, especially those with disabilities, enabling public safety and homeland security agencies, as well as various enterprises within various market sectors, such as healthcare, energy, education, and transportation to introduce new communication technologies and developing policies that encourage innovation and investment in and transition to new communication technologies, devices, and services that will support job creation and economic growth. Engineers are deployed throughout the FCC and from space innovation to new broadcast standards to 6G and beyond. The FCC's policy portfolio is filled with interesting and challenging engineering work, said FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel. Our Honors Engineer Program is a unique opportunity for the newest engineers to work closely with experienced professionals in this field to ensure that the FCC is best prepared to face the challenges of next-generation communication networks. The announcement will close once 175 applications have been received or on December 2, 2022, whichever occurs first. Visit USA Jobs for the complete position summary and to apply at www.usajobs.gov.
The third summer camp program for young radio amateurs from the Americas has been scheduled for July 16th through the 21st, 2023 at Carlington University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. According to the Youth on the Air organization, a team from the Radio Amateurs of Canada will serve as the local host for the camp. The previous two camps were held at the National Voice of America Museum of Broadcasting in Ohio. Online applications will be accepted starting December 1st from amateurs aged 15 through 25 residing in North, Central, or South America. A maximum of 30 campers will be accepted. Priority will be given to first-time applicants and those living outside the United States. Returning campers will serve as leaders during the camp. The Youth on the Air organization encourages potential campers from outside Canada to start now on the process of obtaining a passport and any visas that may be necessary. More information is available on the Youth on the Air website or from Camp Director Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. Here is this week's AMSAT report from Bruce Page, KK5DO. We have learned from the FO99 command team and JAMSAT that the satellite should be operational for the next month as it remains in full sunlight. The DigiTalker, though, will be turned off during this time. And there is an informative AMSAT story in this week's ARRL letter outlining tracking for the Artemis 1 moon mission, uh, moon mission using welcome beacons. All of the details on that story at the ARRL.org slash letter website. During the recent AMSAT UK space colloquium held on October 8th, AMSAT announced that the fast scan ham television unit for the ISS is repaired and on the way to Houston for testing. The flight date is dependent on testing. Ham TV has been inoperative since April 2018. It had been active since April 2014, having been launched to the ISS in 2013. It was returned to Earth for diagnosis and repair in late 2018. The ARIS Ham TV transmitter is capable of downlinking DVB-S digital video of ARIS contacts and other activities on board the ISS to amateur ground stations in the 2.3 GHz amateur band. In radio sport contesting this week, on October 27th, the RSGB 80-meter autumn series, SSB, that's phone. On October 28th, the Zombie Shuffle, that's CW. On October 29th, the CQ Worldwide DX SSB contest, that is phone. On November 1st, there are three offerings. The Worldwide Sideband Activity Contest is phone. The QCX Challenge, that's CW. And the Silent Key Memorial Contest, that is also CW. November 2nd, the VHF UHF FT8 Activity Contest on FT8. November 2nd is the UKE ICC 80 Meter Contest, that's on phone. November 3rd and 4th, the Walk for the Bacon QRP contest, that's CW. And on uh, November 3rd, the NRAU 10-meter activity contest, that's CW phone and digital. Also on November 3rd, the SKCC Sprint Europe, that is CW. And some upcoming section, state, and division conventions. On October 29th, the Copa Fest, hosting the ARRL Arizona Convention, that's in Maricopa, Arizona. On November 5th and 6th, the Stone Mountain Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Georgia Section Convention, that's in Lawrenceville, Georgia. November 12th, the Montgomery ARC Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Alabama State Convention, that's in Montgomery, Alabama. November 12th, also, the Rock Hill Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL South Carolina Section Convention, that's in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And on December 9th and 10th, the Tampa Bay Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL West Central Florida Section Convention, that's in Plant City, Florida. It's time for the Weekly Propagation Forecast Report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports that not much happened on the sun over the past few days from the point of view of a terrestrial observer. Overall activity was low. Of note, though, the co-rotating interaction region hit Earth's magnetic field on October 22nd, sparking a G1-class geomagnetic storm and bright auroras around the Arctic Circle. Earth's magnetic field calmed down and active sunspot regions began to sink beyond the southwestern edge of the solar disk, while others emerged in the northeast. Although helioseismic maps revealed interesting activity on the sun's far side, this will likely end before it emerges on the eastern edge of the solar disk. So, sunspot activity seems listless. Average daily sunspot numbers went from 57.3 to 58.4, while solar flux went from 119.6 to 
On Thursday, the day after the reporting week ended, the sunspot number was 72, over 13 points above the previous seven-day average. Perhaps this is a promising sign. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux will be 125 on October 28th to November 3rd, 112 on November 4th and 5th, 118 on November 6th through the 9th, 115 on November 10th through the 12th, 112 on November 13th and 14th, and 110 on November 15th. The rise in solar flux on the first week of November to 160 presented in the previous two editions of this forecast is gone from the current prediction, but this coming week's forecast is more optimistic for the near term. Finally, looking at the predicted planetary A index, it will be 8, 18, 22, 15, 12, 10, and 8 on October 28th through November 3rd. It'll be 5 on November 4th through the 9th, then 18, 18, and 15 on November 10th through the 12th, and 5 on November 13th through the 17th. Foundations of Amateur Radio when people think about and discuss my chosen hobby, amateur radio, there's often a perception that it's old men sitting behind a radio tapping on a morse key, making beeping noises surrounded by all manner of imposing equipment stacked thick and high in a tiny room that soon becomes too stifling to spend much time in. While such scenes might exist, often reinforced by old photos and messy radio shacks, any self-respecting amateur will tell you that plenty of time is spent outside the shack dealing with antennas, coax and earthing systems, combined with pouring concrete, building, erecting and climbing towers, and myriad of other physical activity. My experience has shown that my own inertia bending acts often involve things like camping, portable operation in ever-changing environments, throwing ropes into trees and recovering those later, erecting verticals, tying down squid poles and other muscular movements, like building temporary rotators lashed to the nearest utility vehicle to take advantage of a multiband Yagi that someone brought along to play with during a field day. The first time I really discovered just how lacking my stamina is was in early 2014, when the Foxtrot Tango 5 Zulu Mike de-expedition team to Amsterdam Island was in town. I had the pleasure of spending a day with a couple of team members showing off the sights of my QDH, Perth in Western Australia. In the middle of the city is Kings Park. To give you a sense of scale at over 400 hectares, Perth's Kings Park is larger than New York Central Park and London's Hyde Park. One of the attractions is the Dual Spiral Staircase DNA Tower. At 15 metres height, it is the highest viewing point in Kings Park, offering 360 degree views of the park and the city surrounding it. Commissioned in 1966, the tower has 101 steps and has recently been refurbished. It derives its name from the DNA double helix molecule, which is how the staircases are arranged. One of my companions on the climb to the top was a sprightly amateur who's been licensed a decade longer than I've been alive. I marvelled when Arnie, November 6 Hotel California, essentially ran up the tower when all I was able to achieve was puff my way up in his wake. Since then, I've discovered that doing 24-hour contests, camping and other fun stuff now absolutely kicks the stuffing out of me, often requiring that I spend a day in a small dark room recovering with a blanket over my head. While my body, shape and call sign have things in common, and my doctor continues to encourage me to lose weight, I can say that my recent visit to hospital, unexpected as it was, reminded me in no uncertain terms that I should look after myself, if only so I can actually participate in the next contest or camp out. I'm not going to tell you what my fitness plan is, nor am I going to tell you to embark on one of your own, other than to ask, have you considered just how much of this wonderful hobby goes beyond keying a microphone or tapping a keyboard, and consider just how safe you really are when you next climb up a ladder, tower or other height to fix an antenna? Speaking of health, I've been absolutely blown away by the incoming messages, offers of help, shared gallbladder emergency and post-operative experiences, and more, from people whom I've known for years through to amateurs who took a chance to introduce themselves and wish me well. It wasn't until this week that I really understood that this community is rich in personal lived history, going well beyond the experiences I've had outside the hobby. I'm ever so grateful for your encouragement and intend to keep fighting to get well. It's going to take some time, but I'm looking forward to when I can next camp out and not regret my life choices. So, get off your sedentary and go do something, will ya? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. We unfortunately have two silent keys to tell you about this week. 
First, the Minnesota ham radio community is grieving the loss of an active longtime radio operator who was formally recognized for his generous spirit and decades of involvement. Mike Sigelman, K0BUD, described himself as one enthusiastic amateur radio operator. He wrote, I have been licensed since 1955 and keep heavily involved both on the air as well as in the local amateur community. Mike became a silent key on Thursday, October 20th, but not before the former broadcast professional also left a deep imprint in amateur radio. The ARRL honored him in 2013 with the President's Award in recognition of his years of commitment and service to various league programs. Earlier this year, he was given the Public Service Award from the Maple Grove Radio Club, K0LTC. An enthusiastic participant in local nets, contesting and DXing, he had also served as president of the Twin City FM Club and the public relations officer for the ARRL's Minnesota section manager. His survivors include his wife, Judy, N0OEL, and a ham respected in Finland for his wide-ranging work as a mentor, a pioneer, and a renowned botanist, has become a silent key. Peter Tiggerstead, OH5NQ, OH2BM, was considered one of the most prominent figures in amateur radio in Finland. A news report from the Wireless Institute of Australia quotes Marty Lane, OH2BH, as calling Peter a pioneer on both the high and low ends of the HF spectrum. A professor by vocation, his other love was to mentor young radio contesters in Finland and welcome them to his contest station, OH5Z. Born in 1936, he was remembered by Al 4L5A, writing in a column on DXNews.com, Now the OH5Z group has lost their father figure and are looking longingly towards the horizon. Beyond radio, the Helsinki University professor emeritus achieved fame as an expert in plant breeding, most especially the rhododendron. He developed a variety that bears his name. The Wayne Amateur Radio Club manned a 30-foot-tall mobile observational infrastructure protection unit, or Skywatch Tower, at Ohio's Wayne County Fair in September again this year. Staffed by specially trained amateur radio volunteers, that tower provided 24-hour surveillance, monitoring, and a record of activity on the fairgrounds that included medical emergencies, lost children, and other situations where help may have been needed. Captain Doug Hunter, KE8JNH of the Wayne County Sheriff's Office, was impressed with its performance. Last year, I put in a request for the tower from the Ohio Department of Homeland Security, Hunter said, and after seeing the benefit of having it, I immediately requested the unit again for this year's fair. Positioned near the grandstand, that tower gave volunteers a bird's eye view of the midway that allows one person to see from the air what four or five people can see from the ground. The observation deck is equipped with state-of-the-art video equipment and provides situational awareness in places where there are large crowds in attendance. Eric Mass, W8ELM, said the club memberships who have additional training, apart from their amateur radio licensing exams, takes just monitoring the crowd. Through our training, we understand how to communicate with law enforcement, said Mass. We know what they need to hear. If we see a situation that needs their attention, our radio is connected to directly to their dispatch inside their command center on the fairgrounds. And once we report it, we are out of the loop, and law enforcement manages everything from that point on. Captain Hunter added that as long as this is available to us, we will take advantage of it. If we can utilize something that increases the safety of fairgoers, we will take advantage of that. WARC members donated more than 60 hours of their time, and we are very thankful for them. Also, thanks to Dan Starcher, Public Communications Specialist for the Wayne County Commissioner's Office in Worcester, Ohio, for information contained in today's story. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. With an array of pan, tilt, and zoom cameras, the tower unit provides a 360-degree view of the fair's most vulnerable areas. It's climate control and is capable of being self-powered to ensure continuous operation. According to the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Northeast Victoria Amateur Radio Club, which responded with financial support, when historic floods ravaged so many towns earlier this year, has revived its funding initiative as parts of Victoria and New South Wales battle new flood conditions. Beginning in early 2022, as the brainchild of committee members Gary Reeve, VK2XF, and Matt Bilston, VK3VS, 
This emergency response effort shows that not all amateur assistance is necessarily accomplished with radios alone. Club Secretary Frank Scott, VK2 BFC, said that the earlier initiative began with $2,000 from the club and quickly grew to more than $3,000 with donations from individual amateurs and other clubs. As before, the club is asking members of the community who have had losses in the current flooding to apply to the club for an e-gift card that can be taken to soup markets or other retail outlets to replace some of what was lost. Community members are being encouraged to apply for the cards, which are valued at an average of $100. He said that the club is also prepared to work directly with hams who lost equipment or towers in the flood to help them replace what is needed and reestablish their stations. Because many hams also belong to local emergency services, the club saw this as an extension of its public service mission. Frank said that after seeing the destruction from the latest wave of flood water, club members decided that the most appropriate response was to conduct their assistance program once again. Frank said further, as we say, when floods happen, we rise above them as a ham community. Students from the Crop Protection Student Association at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez participated in a communications practice session as part of the yearly Great Puerto Rico Shakeout Drill on October 20th, 2022. International Shakeout Day draws millions of people worldwide to participate in earthquake drills at work, school, or home. To tell us a little more about International Shakeout Day, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. ARRL Puerto Rico Section Assistant Manager Leda Rios, WP4RBK, presented a conference entitled Radio Services and the Great Shakeout, which provided service and hands-on activities about how to use different personal radio services in the event of an earthquake. Staff members and students learned about the amateur radio service and several other radio services as well. Participants had the opportunity to talk with several amateurs using simplex frequencies and repeaters. Many were interested in learning more about radio communications, and the event answered questions about how amateur radio can assist during emergencies when other means of communications fail. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. The drill was attended by students and staff members. Information on how to obtain an amateur radio license and where to obtain radio equipment was also available. The Andrew Johnson Amateur Radio Club in Greenville, Tennessee, recently received two grants to help promote growth and understanding of amateur radio. Andrew Johnson Amateur Radio Club Secretary and Treasurer Larry Whiteside, KN4MVH, said the club received a $500 grant from their local Walmart distribution center. Dennis Holt, ND4DWH, works for the center and is involved with Walmart's Volunteerism Always Pays program. Walmart provides grants to eligible organizations where their employees volunteer. The grant was used to purchase amateur radio books for the Greenville Green County Public Library. We are unable to update the library with current and used books about amateur radio, including licensing and equipment, said Whiteside. The second AJRC grant of 5570 was from the ARRL Foundation Club Grant Program, funded by Amateur Radio Digital Communications. That grant, said Whiteside, will help create a science, technology, engineering, math, or STEM class for Green County youth from 8 to 18 years old. The youth STEM through the Amateur Radio Project is designed to help students expand their knowledge of amateur radio and get their technician class license. The program will be administered with the Green County Makers and Free Wildlings Homeschool Playgroup. The AJARC will furnish all materials and equipment, including a radio, which will be installed at the Green County Makers location. We actually had a trial program before writing the submission for the grant, said Whiteside. Not only did the youth participate, but so did many of the parents. The Andrew Johnson Amateur Radio Club is an ARRL affiliated club. With a call sign of VU2CUW, 27 year old amateur radio operator Sabrajet Singh Chabra will be in Antarctica as a member of the Indian Scientific Expedition to Antarctica on December 9th. He will be accompanying the team to either Bharati or Maitri stations in the White Continent. Sabrajet, who got his ham radio operating license in 2015, will be one of the youngest members of the contingent and he is feeling happy and nervous at the same time. 
as it is his first international trip ever. He landed the opportunity while chatting with a customer, Bhagavati Prasad Samval, at his startup, Hobbitivity. Bhagavati is also a radio operator with the call sign VU3BPZ and has already been on the expedition to Antarctica. Sabrajet also credits his father, an ex-serviceman and amateur radio operator, VU2CRS, for being his guiding light throughout his technical journey. Sabrajet, who was born in Ahmedabad and grew up in Delhi, worked in HF Signals in Hyderabad for seven months and fell in love with the city. Hyderabad is sort of a hub for amateur radio activity and I made a lot of close friends here. I am a foodie and still miss the taste of Birani, he said. He is on a contract with the National Center for Polar and Ocean Research at Goa, and this expedition is conducted by them every year. I had a walk-in interview with a panel of 11 scientists at the Ministry of Earth Sciences in Delhi, and I was selected. I had pre-Antarctic training in Ali, and I will be reporting to Goa on November 22nd and will go through five days of training. After this, we will be leaving for Cape Town in South Africa and then into Antarctica, share Subrajet. Two teams, research and logistics, will be part of the expedition. I will be in the logistics team. We are basically the support system to the research team. There are two radio operators on the team, and I've opted to be posted at the Bharati station, but the posting has been kept a surprise. I will be needed to take care of the VHF communications, as there are no cell coverage in Antarctica, and everything has to communicate via VHF radios that are basically handheld radios, he says. Sabrajet is also excited about conducting his own experiments in his leisure time, and he is taking HF radios, VHF radios, and other personal equipment along with him. He has a Kenwood dual-band radio, and it has capabilities of sending emails over the radio. I would like to work on propagation of high frequencies from Antarctica to India and other stations in my proximity. I am not sure of the success because the ham radio hobby is all about experimentation, Cher Sabrajet who has applied for a new call sign, AT42I, for this expedition. He did his bachelor's in electronics and communications at JMIT Rador and is also into 3D printing and designing and making his own 3D printers. He also makes CNC machines and is into web designing as well. I might go to the UK for my master's in robotics or drone technology after my expedition. I want to have my own makerspace one day open it to the general public, and work on projects. I want to be remembered even after I'm gone, he concludes. Registration is now open for Nashua Area Radio Society's Fall 2022 Ham Boot Camp. The online event is scheduled for Saturday, November 5th, 2022, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. There is no charge to attend the ham boot camp, which entails a variety of informative presentations and activities related to amateur radio and is geared toward new operators of any licensed class that wish to learn more about getting on the air. Additionally, ham boot camp allows those thinking of becoming hams to see what the hobby is all about. The sessions usually have anywhere from 100 to 400 attendees, and over the past several years, more than 800 have attended. More information is available at the Nashua Area Radio Society's website. The Nashua Area Radio Society of New Hampshire is an ARRL special service club. The Polish Amateur Radio Union, PZK, is conducting a memorial activation from the 1st to the 6th of November, asking amateurs to make contact with the station SP0SKM and provide the name and call sign of the silent key they wish to commemorate. Hams will be able to do this on 80, 40, and 20 meters using CW and SSB and locally on 2 meter FM. The PZK's editorial office is promoting this event, which is being called in translation, Remembrance of Those Who Passed Away. The special event station operators will create an SK remembrance list based on SK stations noted in the log. Each radio contact is eligible for a certificate, which will be able to be downloaded later, commemorating the event and the silent key submitted. If a ham wishes to honor more than one silent key, it must be done on another day in a different QSO. The Polish organization's website says, In this way, we will honor the memory of those we no longer hear on the amateur bands. 
And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. When climbing on a commercial tower, we need to be aware of RF safety laws. Exposure has been the subject of debate lately, especially since the guidelines have been introduced into the amateur's vocabulary. There are certain requirements you need to be aware of. Some are required by law and some are not. This all depends on the tower and how it is loaded with commercial services. For those of you who are not aware of the federally mandated safety guidelines, there's a general set of rules about working safely with sources of energy. Lockout, tagout is a phrase which refers to the use of safety devices to help prevent accidental injury to workers servicing equipment. On towers, lockout tagout can include seals on breaker switches, inline coax switches, or other similar devices. I'm not going to refer to any specifics, but to good personal safety guidelines. If you are working on a shorter tower with perhaps a few paging systems, you need to consider exposure to RF as well as the risk of injury from contact with active antennas. When you are working on or near an antenna or its feed line, you must ensure that it is difficult or impossible for someone to turn on the transmitter while you are on the tower. If you are at 250 feet and your partner is on the ground, another person working in the transmitter shack could easily turn on the transmitter that is attached to your body. It is your responsibility to unplug the transmitter's power cord or remove the fuses, mark or lock the breaker so anyone else not involved in your work cannot accidentally turn on the injury-causing transmitter. Before you start working, make sure everyone in the area is aware of what should or should not be turned on and install some sort of locking device. A cable tie is suitable as a lockout in many circumstances. I sometimes put cable ties through the holes in the prongs of a 115 volt plug to prevent it from being plugged in while I'm on the tower. If I'm working on a hard wired system, I may remove the coax and cable tie it to something inside the cabinet along with something like my car keys to prevent me from forgetting to reconnect the coax as well as preventing it from getting turned on and cooking my fingers off. When working on a crowded tower, you may have to arrange to climb at pre-scheduled off-air times to minimize exposure to powerful RF fields. I will not climb near an active broadcast antenna and prefer to climb near active paging system antennas during off-peak times. This is another reason why I prefer to climb at night. The essence of lockout tagout is to ensure that the system you're working on is at or very close to a zero potential energy state. Equally important is that the energy supply to the device is locked in a zero energy state by any reasonable means which would prevent a casual user from activating the device while you are working on it. Some simple methods of locking out a transmitter would include shutting off a breaker and locking it in the off position, removing fuses and locking the fuse box shut, switching off a breaker and using a hardware store breaker lock and tag to mark it out of service. For the home-based amateur, shutting off the power to the radios connected to the, TV, to the tower is a good beginning. Unplugging power cords or unhooking coax wires is another. Here's another good reason to have a ground crew. They can also become involved in lockout tagout. Just remember to lower each device to a zero energy state before starting the climb. Sometimes this is not possible, but always plan for the safest climb. After doing it several times, it'll become second nature to you. There's a lot more on lockout tagout than I have time to cover here. So if you're climbing for a living, be sure to review your employer's safety and exposure guidelines. Another place to look for information is the OSHA webpage or your state's electrical safety codes. Remember, you cannot tell if an antenna is transmitting just by looking at it. Direct contact with a transmitting antenna can leave you with an instantaneous and very painful burn. Getting a second degree burn on the palm of your hand at 150 feet on a tower would ruin anyone's day. Also keep in mind that just because a transmitter is unplugged, it may still offer a small voltage difference between the tower and that antenna. 
it is impossible to attain the exact same ground potential between all the systems on a tower. So the risk of a shock while climbing will always be present. Just be careful when you touch antennas on towers. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Federal Communications Commission this week voted to approve a notice of inquiry seeking comment on the current use of the 12.7 to 13.25 gigahertz band, as well as ways to encourage more efficient use of the band and whether it's suitable for mobile broadband services. The following can be attributed to Kathleen Burke, Policy Counsel at Public Knowledge, who said in a release, we applaud Chairwoman Rossenworcel for her continued leadership in looking for new ways to share access to spectrum for vital telecommunication services like mobile broadband and Wi-Fi. Limited spectrum access is a clear barrier to closing the digital divide and ensuring that all Americans have access to the crucial telecommunication services we rely on to function in our society. Finding creative ways to provide more spectrum access is an important goal that we applaud the FCC for continuing to pursue. Because of the urgency in promoting competition in the mobile broadband and increasing unlicensed spectrum access generally, we urge the Commission to issue an order authorizing shared use in the lower 12 GHz band. Opening the lower 12 GHz in addition to the upper 12 GHz would potentially make over 1,000 megahertz of spectrum available for advanced services. Few people understand the value of the El Dorado County Neighborhood Radio Watch in California better than the members who have joined the group since it began in 2019. The Radio Watch's life-saving communication efforts using general mobile radio service equipment combines with those of the El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club to save lives, some even of their own members. This has been especially critical during wildfires and other disasters. The two organizations are now working together even more closely and more formally following the creation of a nonprofit corporation known as the Community Emergency Radio Association, or CERA. As a fundraising arm for the two radio groups, CERA is there to receive donations and apply for community safety grants, magnifying the life-saving potential of these local radio sentinels. Alan Thompson, W6WN, said that the teamwork goes beyond even that ambitious agenda. CERA is also a mentoring group, assisting in emergency preparedness, public safety exercises, and instruction to prepare for the amateur radio licensing exams. Alan, who is the public information officer for the groups, said that the Eldorado Hams membership role has grown, and the neighborhood Radio Watch now has 500 members throughout the county. Allen said that the groups are also consulting with several other ham radio clubs both in and outside of California. Allen gave a presentation recently to the Cool Pilot Hill Advisory Committee at the Pilot Hill Grange on Monday, October 24th. And finally this week, amateurs are always fighting the battle on radio frequency interference. One cause of RFI on ships is their refrigeration systems. Here with more details on this is Steve Richards, G4HPE. Practical Sailor magazine has featured an article by Daryl Nicholson about eliminating radio frequency interference from fridges on board vessels. He's a marine installer who says this is a common problem, and recently he came across another boat with a radio frequency issue coming from a frigger boat refrigeration system. The boat was built with two Danfoss fridge compressors, but when one was replaced recently, the boat's single sideband radio whined when the new compressor was running. Darrell ran through the normal radio frequency isolation procedures, but he hasn't had much luck yet. It seems like radio frequency leakage might be a good topic to explore. What really works to solve it? What installation procedures are necessary? Whether you're a professional or an amateur, tracking down radio frequency problems can drive you round in loops. The manufacturer of the compressors, Danfoss, offers some guidance for tracking down and eliminating the annoying hiss that its equipment can generate on some radio frequencies.
They recommend that if the noise source has several components, all of which may contribute to interference, separate each potential source to observe its effect. The vessel's battery is an effective trap for the electrical noise reaching the power connections from the noise source. To make effective use of that trap, they suggest connecting the noise source directly to the battery with the shortest length of wire possible. No other device should be connected to this run of wire. Twisting the power leads will reduce the ability of the power leads to act as an antenna. The most effective way to reduce emissions from the power leads is to use shielded cable. All accessories and control leads at the noise source should be examined. Reduce lengths to the minimum and twist and apply grounded shields as needed. It can be helpful to ground the negative power lead to the frame of the noise source. Look for a screw which can clamp a short copper strap from the negative power lead to the frame of the noise source. A filter could be applied to the main battery power supply leads close to the noise source. The current rating of this filter should be about twice the maximum current rating of the noise source. If little noise is radiated, a filter at the power connections of the affected equipment may be less costly. You can read the full article at www.practical-sailor.com. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, x-ray bravo sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use anchor audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you seven...